Hello and welcome back to the Rugby Pod. I'm Andy Rowe and Big Jim and Gertie are with me as usual. We'll be rounding up a big weekend for the Northern Hemisphere in the Autumn Nation Series. Plus we'll be joined by England scrum half Rafi Quirk and former Springbok skipper Jean de Villiers. So settle back, enjoy and make sure you've subscribed on Spotify. How's your week been, lads? Bollocks. What? Yeah, hey, you what? Bollocks. What's Duh. happened? Bollocks. Oh, as we're bollocks. Yeah, bollocks. As in not bollocks are out, as in just, bo- well, arguably they are. I mean, I'm not tired. We're in a candle, aren't we? So that's what happens. you just got to work, Jim. So, so you're bollocks. You, you've been in Italy again. I mean, what's going on? You've three weekends on the, on the spin in Italy. Tell me this weekend you took the missus and the kids. Tell me that's why you're tired. You treated the whole family to go to, where were you, Treviso? Well, I thought I was in southern Italy until I came off my phone in the taxi and did a pin drop and realised we were north of the boot. I was like, what are we doing up here? I thought we were down south. Um, no, it was just me uh, and Scott Hastings for the big one, Italy, Uruguay, um, Los Terros, they're called. And what an absolute classic it was. And, you know, the good thing about these trips are, the good thing about these trips are, and I try and take the positives out of it, no disrespect to Italy and Uruguay, albeit it was absolute toilet. Um, but I'm in Italy. I'm at the Is it that bad? Of, uh, it was it was it was awful, but I don't want to talk about the game. What I want to talk about is the fact that when you're in a foreign country, Italy, beautiful country, you want to go out there, don't you, and, and test the local cuisine and drink the wine and the grappa, be indoors with a fire in a place that looks like a cave in a vineyard, just somewhere kind of historic. Or you want to be sat outside in the Baltic cold, drinking red wine out of a plastic glass and eating pizza because nowhere will let you in because you've got pre booked because of COVID. So <laughs> when you look at the experience that I've had in Italy, um, yeah, it wasn't it wasn't Twickenham, it wasn't Paris, but nonetheless, it was a weekend well travelled. It's probably as good as I can put it. I mean, I don't know if anyone's had the local wine in Italy out of a plastic glass while it's three degrees, eating a pizza and it looks like it's just been put in the microwave from Audi. But nonetheless, <laughs> it makes you appreciate decent travel. So big shout out to Italy, Uruguay. Hopefully we never see you again. And <laughs> <laughs> we move forward. We move forward because, uh, yeah, no, I've been looking. I can't moan too much, but again... Do not watch Italy or Uruguay again, please don't. Unless you're watching this one back and to get the views up from three to four. Um, I was going to say, yeah, how many so, people do you reckon watched it on Amazon Prime? Five. <laughs> and that was Beck, just to check you're actually working and not out on the piss somewhere. That was Beck and the kids. <laughs> You've made some improvements to your get up though, haven't you, Jim? You were looking sharp. Yeah, I, I, went, I didn't go as sharp this weekend because... It's not all about me, is it? It's about Italy and Uruguay, the big one. So I, what I wanted to do was just play it down a little bit because I didn't want to take the shine off the pitch. Here's one for you, actually, Goody. A blast from the past. Um, yeah. do, you remember, do you remember Craig White? Whitey! Uh, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, is he Rice doing Uruguay? Lions. Well, I thought he was doing Italy. So I was like, mate, what yeah. are you doing with the Italians? He's like, yeah. He says, I know it's a bit of a random one. I was like, give me a snapshot. Like, why are you lads not any good at the minute? He's like, we've got four or five big injuries. I'm like, you've got Jake Pledger, who else is injured? He says, no, no, oh, with the Uruguayans. I was like, what? Los Terros? He says, yeah. I said, do you speak Uruguayan? He's like, do I fuck? I was, <laughs> I was like, you've got arguably one of the best performance directors and strength and conditioning coaches of the professional era. Yeah. And he's helping Los, Los Terros nearly beat Italy in Parma Ham. Yeah, <laughs> but he was asking for you. He's anyway. a, uh, yeah, he's a great bloke, yeah. Whitey. My days at Leicester, yeah. he, he put a smile on my face every day. Literally the best um, guy I've ever worked with in terms of high performance, everything like that. Uh, geez, he could get blood out of a stone, that bloke. He got me down in weight and being able to play and train effectively. So he's a legend, that bloke. Uh, yeah, well, my, I had an interesting week, actually. Um, I did a farmer's dinner. Up you in say Peter, that right? every week. You say that every week. I had an interesting well, I have, week. Well, like, so. <laughs> We're, We're busy, farm again. mate. We're busy. Well, not a farm, but I spoke at a farmer's dinner on Wednesday night up in Peterborough. But I got a bit of a complaint, actually. I like farmers. I like farms. I like taking the kids to the farm. But what is it with farmers? Like, in this time of COVID, uh, one of my big things, I go to these dinners, right, and we speak at dinners and events and all this stuff. Everyone loves a shake of the hand, right? 
and I'm all for fist bumps now because of COVID. I'm all about fist bumps. No handshaking. The farmers don't do a fist bump to save their life. They want to shake your hand. And I watched a lot of farmers go in and out of the toilets, not wash their hands, come out, and they try and shake your hand and crush it as hard as you can. And then you look at their hands, fucking minging farmers' hands. Like black. A new system. <laughs> it's just, honestly, it's the... It's unbelievable. And they try and crush your hand. And then you're looking at the heart, looking at it, it's brown. I reckon it's got cow shit on it and all this. And then they're eating with their hands. Great people, but my God, they could do with a hygiene lesson. I don't like shaking people's hands. I like washing my hands and keeping them clean. I probably wash my hands 25 times a day, like I'm weird like that. And well, it, that's because so you eat 25 times a day. So you normally wash yeah, your hands yeah. after eating. Is that right? Yeah, probably right, mate. Probably right. Um, so that was that was Wednesday, but good people. They're very good people, farmers. They like a drink, but. My God, hygiene's questionable. Uh, and then Twickenham, Saturday. Uh, what a day that was, eh, James? Uh, I had a, hosted a Q&A with Faf de Klerk and his lovely hair. Got to stroke his hair, which is quite nice. He does have lovely hair, does Faf de He definitely uses sons, I'll tell you that stuff. Um, so I was there at Twickenham hosting a Q&A with him. Uh, and then Kieran Bracken did a Q&A with him as well. Geez, he could do with a hair transplant. I told him as well. So, uh, yeah, busy, mate, busy. And then what an atmosphere, eh? We beat the world champions, the best team in the world. So England, I think, are pretty much the best team in the world right now, aren't we? Well, you say atmosphere, Andrew. I don't know. I was drinking out of a plastic cup eating a pizza in the microwave while I was watching <laughs> it outside. Yeah, I don't remember the Autumn Nations Cup being this exciting. And I think it's probably for a number of reasons. One will be the fact that we've got crowds back in and there's an appetite, and there's an appetite to be at live rugby again. But the big one is, is that we're now competing, aren't we? And I say that we, as in Northern Hemisphere with Southern Hemisphere. And I know we can yeah. talk about it in a bit, good if you want about, but yes, they're clearly fatigued. They've been in bubbles, um, you know, South Africa, Australia and New Zealand. It's been a tough tour for them. It's been a tough few months. But you look at where rugby is now, and it's taken a hammering over the last couple of years for a number of reasons. Mm-hmm. We've gone through them all on here. But I think the product of what we've seen last week and this week uh, makes me personally very happy but more so for the growth of the game and the appetite for fans and everything around growing the game of rugby. Well, you're right. Everyone is back out and uh, back into the crowds and back onto the beers. And they'll be back on the beers again this Wednesday at Flat Iron Square because we're back in London for a live show, lads. You excited? Yeah, I'm not feeling it. No, not yet. I'm not feeling it. <laughs> you need to Give get yourself day. up for this, Jim. Just get away yeah. from the fact you bring the family down to London. What, to a live show to chop beers? Probably not responsibly. <laughs> um, I might ask them to come. That could be my excuse. That could be the way out. But no, um, it's one of them. Not that I've been on a stag do weekend. I told Becky it was quiet. I was drinking out of a plastic cup. Or was I? Was I drinking Russian vodka through the eye in Parma? I wasn't. But it feels like that. So, you know, it's like on the Monday when we record the podcast, just a bit tired, ain't feeling it. Come tomorrow, come Tuesday, lads. I am flying. I've not booked my flight or my train. Um, producer Fred who sorts the expenses out I'm sorry I will sort that out probably on one Wednesday morning where it's arguably it's, well it doesn't get any more expensive does it but yeah I'll be coming down Wednesday at some point is what I'm trying to say so I am looking forward to it I suppose actually I'm, gonna, I'm buzzing and we've got a huge guest as well it doesn't get any bigger than this Dan Carter Nemani Dodolo okay, oh literally yeah. yeah literally doesn't get any bigger he's a big old unit. yeah looking forward to that actually how quickly do you reckon Nemzi can drop Drop a pint. I could be like I mean, that shot. Like you're that big, your your hands are going to be huge. Surely you just open the gullet and down she goes. Well, we'll find that, Andrew. <laughs> just head to eventbrite.co.uk and search for the rugby pod. If you fancy coming along, there are still a couple of tickets available there. So, well, let's get into the rugby, shall we? Shall we start in Paris? What a game! What a game! What an atmosphere! And. When are New Zealand going to learn? When Wayne Barnes is refereeing, do not wear the grey shirt, boys. <laughs> like, what, we were saying that what, before the game. We're like, no. Like, I just don't get it. The All Blacks, why do you even need a grey shirt? Why are they wearing a grey shirt? Well, it's our alternative strip, but I don't know why we're doing the alternative strip. If that's well, the question. It, you've, you've seen it, yeah, this is the thing. So you've seen it in the Autumn Nations Cup, haven't you? Like England wore their alternate strip once. Home team, though. Um... Oh, it's money. Oh, it's money. Is that what you're yeah. saying? Oh, well, sorry. Okay, you said it, Andrew, not me. No, you, you did say it. Just, but everyone's worn them, but it's generally been the home teams. You know, the Australians wore their chain strip at the weekend. Um, I say chain strip, it was a, a nod to the Indigenous population there um, and their heritage. So, yeah, but 
New Zealand wearing your grey shirts. 2007 boys, Wayne Barnes referee, the grey shirts come out. Oh, no, 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 France time. And this time, you took, what did you take? 50 points. Just about. Pants time, your ankles time, right. wasn't it? Imagine the skids. How about Roman Intermax effort? Peace. Um, goal. Effort. Andrew, you've opened him up there. I, I can't work out whether that's a great picture or not. I mean, I'd be happy with it. <laughs> <laughs> There's definitely, definitely some blood in it, mate. There's definitely some blood in it, isn't there? How? That is, after a, I've always said, like, Paul Scholes is like, that level of, of dehydration is, would be me, probably for a week after a rugby match. So if, if my cake got ripped off or you saw some see-through cyclones with me, you'd be like, is this Jim or is this Jane? Um, <laughs> either way, I wouldn't be happy. But Roman, Romain, Roman, um, looked very good. But anyway, we're going to talk about his performance on the pitch. I spoke to Freddie Burns last week, Andrew, and yeah. I, I said, give me your t- top two or three fly outs. And he said, even though Roman's been playing 12, and has been playing 12, he'd have him. I was like, big call, big call. Is it? As we know, he's, unbelie- well, he's unbelievable. What, as in top one or two in the world? But have you not seen him play for the last two years? Well, I did at the weekend now, I agree. <laughs> <laughs> that's my point. I was, that's, that's the whole thing I was looking at. I was like, all right, Fred, enjoy Nashville, Tennessee. Um, you're obviously <laughs> looking at the rugby, just plucking a, a, a player out the top of your head and all right. And then I texted him at the weekend. I went, oh my God. Yeah, ridiculous. And that was a big turning point, wasn't it? Um, you know, and it could have been, you know, one of the greatest ever tries um, that France has scored back to that try that they scored from the end of the world um, back in the day. But but you only need to look at Untermax try in the first half where he steps inside. Um, I think he steps inside Richie Moanga and just watch Ardi Salvea. Ardi Salvea gets like, doesn't even get half checked by Winnie Antonio on the short line. The bloke can't even move because he's absolutely fucked. Um, and Untermac goes through a hole. So obviously Untermac sees the disconnect and sees how like the, the, the All Blacks forwards were absolutely shagged and um, goes through the hole. But you've got balls and you've got balls. 27-25 up, New Zealand have got all the ascendancy, all the momentum. They put the chip kick in through. Uh, and then he just looks like he's jogging. Untermac gets the ball in his own in-goal area. So I think he's done Mwanga first in the end goal. Then he's ran around Jordy Barrett, and Jordy Barrett's meant to be pretty quick. But Untermac looks like he's jogging, and his piece must be flapping everywhere in those shorts. And so then he goes inside to Jamine, and they go the length. Cameron Wocky at the end of it, he ignores Dante and Penno on his outside. It would have been the best try ever, but that was the turning point. They end up getting the um, the, the penalty from it. Obviously, they kick the three. Sa- Sa- they kick the three. Sarve goes to the bin, but then. It's still 30 points to 25 at that point. You're carrying on for a bit. And then Penno gets the intercept. Like the All Blacks, you thought they were going to come back and win it. And Jim, I saw your tweets where you're like, there's no way France are losing this. And then, oh my God, they nearly, you thought about the All Blacks coming back and they showed unbelievable resilience to come back into the game. But then the French just had too much power. The atmosphere sounded unbelievable. Ben Kayser on comms, it's like he's having an orgasm off the time. Ah! All that stuff. So uh, it was amazing to watch. Great game. Saturday night, what better thing to do than watch France against New Zealand that wets the whistle for the World Cup in a couple of years' time, doesn't it? Because that's the opening game. And there's pretty decent entertainment at Twickenham as well. Goody, you were there? Uh, I was all right. <laughs> Andrew, <laughs> tell me, did you have England down in your match point prediction? So I'm just asking, not that I've looked at the leagues, but I know that I'm second in the Guinness League, but I haven't looked at it. Um, did you have England down to beat South Africa? I'm just asking. Well, I'll be honest, my match point predictor started really badly and didn't get much better. I forgot to do the I forgot to do the first two games. I'm in the corporate hospitality. I'm like, oh yeah, Scotland playing Japan. Oh, I haven't done my match point predictor. That's generally what I thought in the middle of hospitality. So I missed and the first two games. Uruguay? Missed that one as well. Oh, okay. So nil point, nil point, nil point. And then I'll be honest. I'll be honest, boys. I had South Africa by eight in my match point predictor. Um, so I apologise to all the England fans. I was in the corporate hospitality doing Q&As, basically telling Faf to clerk, how many are England going to smash South Africa by? Didn't believe a word of what I was saying myself. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but I did it for Good the honesty, fans. Andrew. Yeah, I did it for the fans, did it for the cheers. I generally thought, listen, you know, and you look at the game and it was a classic tale of two halves, wasn't it? In terms of how England played. First half we played with an unbelievable energy. Um, you know, they put width on the ball. We put South Africans under pressure. Um, it was, you know, Henry Slade 
phenomenal. That is a game that he's really stood up. And I've always thought Henry Slade's class, since I played against him when he was about 12 for Exeter, he played 10 uh, against me uh, when I was at Wasps. And that day I was like, he is a silky, classy operator. Yeah. When you get in the Ingham fold, he's always been this player. That he's played a lot and he's a really good player. But because of Ford and Farrell, he's never, in my opinion, been able to express himself perhaps as much as he wanted. He really had to step up on Saturday with obviously Marcus Smith at 10, no Farrell, no Ford, um, you know, and then Manu Tualangi goes off after five minutes, my old hamstring. Um, and he was he was unbelievable. The ball, the long ball um, out to Freddie Stewart, obviously a set player they'd looked at. They'd shown Marcus Smith out the back and he puts a, a flat ball across to, to beat the winger into the space. Absolute class. Um, you know, Damien Diolande in the second half when Henry Slade pumps and puts Marchant through, he's had an absolute stinker defensively. Um, but Slade picks the right option. He was absolutely class, I thought. And England started at a million miles an hour. Great. So the first try after... You know, a few minutes, Manu obviously burst in up the outside after we'd made a few busts. Um, it was it was brilliant. But then ultimately, the South Africans regrouped at half-time uh, and bring on the bomb squad, bring on any squad you want because all my scrums, Marla was in reverse, Carl Sinclair, I think, got his head shoved up his ass a couple of times. I'm going to call Joe Marla out on the hair as well. Absolutely shocking. Absolutely <laughs> abysmal. <laughs> He's not. He's been in, he wasn't, he's been in, he, mate, he's been in isolation for 10 days eating onions. And, and tell, you know tell doing, the do you know what else he's been doing as well? What's that? He's fucking unfollowed me again on Twitter. Oh, mate, who cares? Well, I do. Are you bo- I do. Are you bothered? Well, all, I don't know what's going on. I don't know if he's playing funny buggers with me, but like the verified tweets, they come through and they pop up. Joe Marler followed me again and then he came back and now he's followed me again and now he's not followed me so I was just going to reach out to him and just say mate I asked the COVID but no I can't he's blocked me as well so but bizarre absolutely shocking at the weekend so he's blocked you and now you're calling him out but you want him to follow you but he's not going to follow you now because you've said he's absolutely shocking hey, the bloke has been in isolation with his kids I know days. I'm being horrible I know I'm uh, sorry Joe, eating onions. Again, see me. what do you guys make of Marcus Smith's performance over the weekend without Farrell there so he played well um, you know obviously Penalty to win it was straight in front of the sticks. You'd expect him to get that, but still big spuds to do it. Um, you know, it, it's one of those things, and I've said it all along, our best 10, 12, 13 for me is Smith, Slade and Tirolangi. Um, Obviously, Tirolangi goes off. Marchant, I thought, was outstanding. Picked on the wing, moved to inside centre. Big uh, call but, to pick him, though, wasn't it? I did not even have him even in the match day 23. Yeah, I, I'd, I'd have picked Malins on the wing because of his high ball ability, but yeah, Marchant, and Eddie Jones said it pretty much, didn't he? He talked about the fact that Marchant is unbelievable in the air and we, they knew the aerial threat was coming. And lo and behold, obviously, Manu goes off early. Maidens comes on, does exceptionally well. But Marcus Smith, he's the the here and now and the future. Um, you know, he, he's a guy that needs to be just given the keys, given the freedom to run it as he wants to. Um, you know, he the energy we played with in that first half uh, was exactly what was needed. And, you know, the width that we put on it, the accuracy we had was great. But then... The second half, we're under the cosh, aren't we? And it took massive, massive nuts from the whole team to to go through phase after phase after phase, going behind to then you know, play in a, in a way where we put the South Africans under pressure. And we didn't have the ball in the second half, most of it, did we? Like, it was literally a, a concession of penalties and then kicks. And then, you know, we, we had to find it from winning ourselves to go and win it. We had a bit of magic by Slade at the line to put marching through for Rafi Quirk's try. Um, but, you know, you, you watch that last five minutes and Marcus Smith had a massive part in spraying the ball around, picking the right options, getting England back on the front foot to win the two penalties. And then his footwork and what was Fran Slane doing? Just going in for the old knee drop. Well, I think he's look at, looking at him. I don't want to profile him under the same profile as yourself, but there were visions when he was chasing back. Uh, for the try of you in the billboards playing for Newcastle with the cigarette and a pint in your hand. <laughs> there was a similar, there was like a similar comparable when I was looking at that, which I did yeah. enjoy, obviously, because I'm England till I die. But um, I, mean, I mean, he's done very well, Fran Stein, hasn't he? But rugby, as we know, is about younger players coming through and the young lads for England. My goodness me, what a life. I'm looking at them lads. I'm looking at Freddie Stewart. I'm like, I'm jealous because... My goodness me, the life that you have in front of you and the life that you're living now, you know, Rafi Quirk the same, Marcus Smith the same, you know, obviously uh, Bevan Rod, 
as well. I'm just looking at them like, lads, here we go. Here we go. What a life. Goody, what you were talking about with your uh, best 10, 12, 13, do you, where does that leave Farrell in the whole scheme? Oh, I knew it. I knew why it. Why being horrible? Why, <laughs> why being horrible? Why, why are you being horrible? I mean, it, it, it's a massive dilemma, isn't it? Let's be honest. Um, yeah, there's an elephant in the room around Owen Farrell. He makes him captain, and I get the whole leadership thing. You know, does his form dictate he's in the team at 10? He's been playing quite well at 10, but Eddie Jones just said Marcus Smith is very important to this team now. So you start Marcus Smith at 10, you then say, can Farrell play 12? Well, Henry Slade and Manu Tulangi, they stepped up in the centres over, you know, at, at, at times. And I think that's our best centre combo. Obviously, Manu went off, Marchant comes into the centre. We looked like a different team, didn't we? I, I think the big question is around the captaincy. Um, so if you think he's the only man to be captain, then he's got to put him in the team. But yeah, the bottom line is, I read his injury, he's got to have an operation. So he's out for 10 or 12 weeks, which might take out the first couple of weeks of the Six Nations anyway where we play Italy and, sorry, where we play Scotland first and then Italy second. So five points, five points. Um, and then maybe... Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Personally, I just think he's probably in the squad, but on the bench for me. That's what that's the way I'd look at it. Um, you know, you want excitement, you want players on form, you want players jumping up the bit. Well, he's someone that's always got a place in the team because of his leadership credentials. Um, and you're actually hearing little whispers come out, and I don't know whether they're messages that just we read into. You hear Joe Marler say that Courtney Lords is the people's captain. What does that mean? You know, you ask the question. I'll, of, I'll ask him on Twitter. Oh, no, I won't. <laughs> um, you know, and you, you, you hear stories about, you know, the team spirit's great. Does that mean the team spirit wasn't great before? Uh, and Farrell's only been there for one out of three weeks. I'm not saying anything. I'm just saying that you've got to earn your right to play. And right now... Um, you know, the first couple of first couple of games in the Six Nations, um, I don't think he well, it, it'll be pushed to be fit for anyway. So you've you know you've continuity. Do you on know the bench what I find, best. Andrew, around the leadership stuff, what I find not the most weird, but a lot of people listen to this and a lot of casual fans think that Maratoja should be captain. I know we've touched on it before, but do you not think it's really interesting that Owen goes down? You know, a lot of teams will make their best player captain. So you could arguably say that Mara's, if not the best player, but one of the best players in the England team. Then he goes to Courtney. Then he goes to Tom Curry before he even thinks about Marrow. Whereas a lot of people would think that Marrow should be captain, like during the Lions as well. Alan Wing goes down, people are like, right, well, Marrow's going to be captain. Oh, no, we're going to give it to someone that's never captained the team before, Colin Murray. So yeah. and I listened to Eddie Jones' comments around, oh, Marrow's done really good in the leadership group and you know, he's brought this talking club back together and been speaking to the psychologist, a.k.a. the magician. I don't know what the narrative is around Marrow. I'd be interested to know. But you look at, you talk about Sia Khaleesi and what he's done and, you know, Marrow's perceived story in the background is why someone like Marrow isn't captain. Do you know what I mean? I do not think it's quite interesting that he's that far down the pecking order. And my point being the fact that he's probably the best player in the team. And a lot of teams would just give the best player in the team the captaincy. So no what are you saying? Are you saying he's not captain material or <laughs> what, are you, what are you trying to get out of here? I've never seen Marrow as captain material, no. I have. Oh, yeah. I personally haven't, but it's not about what I think. But I find it very interesting. I've had this many a times as a player. Just because yeah. someone's the best player doesn't mean that they're captain material. But I just think, the, I think what's grown around Marrow... It's, and Eddie's comments around Marcus Smith having to be careful about Emma uh, becoming like Emma Raducanu because she's transcended the game of tennis in terms of winning the US Open and taking all these big deals. And he doesn't want the same to happen to Marcus Smith. Well, that's kind of what Marrow's doing, isn't he? He's with Jay-Z. You know, he's out of these kind of glitz and glamour parties. He's big on social media. He's with Rock Nation. All these things that Eddie seems to really hate when he said that because he didn't say he hated it. I don't want to put words in his mouth, but he mentioned about the captaincy, um, sorry, <clears throat> he mentioned about Marcus Smith and everything that's going to be thrown at him. But I think mm. it is a big point because England are the only team when you look at it really in terms of question marks over who the captain should be. That is what I'm saying. And Owen Farrell, yes, he's injured now. Is he going to be captain in the lead to the World Cup? Well, I suppose, you know, Sexton with Ireland as well. 
Um, maybe it is just the case of it's what it is. It's the coach's prerogative. Let's get a South African view on the game now, then, and we can have a chat with former Springbok captain John de Villiers. How are you, mate? Yeah, good. Thanks, Andy. Uh, not not the result I expected on the weekend, but uh, a good weekend of, of rugby nonetheless. Oh, mate, at least you're smiling. And you're looking pretty tanned as well, then. The weather must be good in South Africa at the minute. That's that's the one positive. Thanks, Giddy. <laughs> but the main question for me is, how long is the video going to be about the ref this week? Because uh, the South Africans in the press, you are <laughs> moaning about Andrew Brace like you wouldn't believe. Yeah, look, um, uh, I was actually, I, I disrupted my my video that I was making on the ref to to come on the, the radio <laughs> pod now. Uh, but, but after Rassi sanctions and, and whatever, uh, I decided against it. Now, look, um, Look, I think I think when we when we start talking about referees, there's there's certainly something there uh, to blame the result on the weekend in the England um, South Africa game purely on on the referee. I think will be will be totally unfair. So, I think credit must go to England for the way that they played. I think they were they were brave in selection. They were brave in the way that they approached the game, and they were able to um, you know to to firstly you know score some fantastic tries against a very solid defensive system. Um, you know, and and you know, at, at last we have Marcus Smith at ten and, and really igniting that backline. So um, I, I think a lot of a lot of exciting stuff uh, for England. And when you look at it, John, did you hand on heart think that the Springboks would have won that game? I mean, there was only one point in it. We were talk, talking just before. I thought that England might win the game because just because of how long the tour has been for South Africa, but. Hand on heart, did you think the South Africa would win this game? Yeah, yeah. Look, I, I said before, and before the before the tour started, I said, you know, you could go into this tour losing all three, or you could go into this tour winning all three. And I think, I think what we've seen, um, especially over the the last two weekends or so, is that you know, certainly in terms of world rugby, teams are so close. You know, there are so many teams competing, and that on the day they can beat anyone else in the world. Um, so many games decided in the last two, three minutes with a kick, you know, one, two, three, four margins in terms of the result, you know, that can so easily go the other way. So if, if you look at it from a, from a South African point, you know, I felt very con confident going, going into this game. Um, you know, if South Africa can again, focus on the, on the uh, quality set phases, you know, play the game that they so used to, but they weren't able to, to play that game. Uh, and, and again, credit to, to England for that. So, um, look, you you learn through it and um, you can go and analyze the game and say, well, okay, we missed some kicks at goal. Uh, yes, some decisions that were made, um, you know, maybe cost us the game. But, you know, it, it is what it is. And you you live by the sword, die by the sword. So um, I think it's it's fantastic for, for world rugby. And, um, you know, if, when you lose, you need to be able to take it on the chin because certainly when we win, we, uh, we let the, the opposition hear it as well. And John... What about the narrative around Rassi? Is it having an effect on the team? We've spoken about loads on here. I love characters in the game. I love what Rassi's done. There was a part of me that enjoyed his video that he put out and then having read Nick Berry's report and stuff like that, it seems from a different perspective that it was quite harsh. But how is it perceived in South Africa? Does everyone love him or are people thinking, hmm, what's going on there? Yeah, look, I think what he's, what he's done uh, for South African rugby, you know, and where we were, you know, call it five years ago or so it was you know we had some dark days so being able to to bring the the glory back the pride back in the jersey um you know he's a he's a great thinker of the game and um and he cares so much and i think a, a big part of what he did was was because he cares so much you know he he knew that or well, he knows that you know it's an opportunity playing the lines that you only get once every 12 years and for him as a you know being part of the the coaching structure or the um, you know, as his role of, of director of rugby, he knew that it, he probably won't get that opportunity again, um, and that he felt he was he was hard done by in you know in that in that first test match, or we were hard, hard done by. So, I think in in general, from a South African point of view, we really enjoy you know Rusty's approach. Um, we enjoy his demeanor. We enjoy the fact that he that he cares so much. You know, and and, and there's a there's a fine line in terms of you know the rugby. Kind of ethos and and whatever and 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 maybe that was borderline in terms of what he did, um, but in general I think he's a guy that 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 people respect in South Africa. Um, you know I played on him at the, at the Stormers and um, you know like I said he he loves the game. He you know he's he's permanently 
analyzing and all of that. And um, he obviously had a bit of frustration after that first test match. Good stuff. And how's, uh, how's retirement, mate? I know you're doing a lot of TV work and various different bits and bobs. Are you enjoying retirement? Or have you been out on the golf course a fair bit with that, Sam? Yeah, look, guys, I'm not as good as, as the two of you on TV um, or, or anything like that. Um, Did you see me on TV? I'm, the I'm, Italy Uruguay one. Obviously, <laughs> my jokes aren't that good either. Um, but, uh, uh, no, look, it's uh, it, it's been good. Um, you know, you, uh, you you boys will know it's uh, you, you missed the game, you missed the, the camaraderie, but uh, I'm very happy where I'm, where I'm at at the moment. Um, you know, staying involved with the game with a, with a bit of TV work is, is pretty cool and and certainly much easier than playing or coaching. Um, and then and then um, you know some some other some other stuff on the go as well. So it's keeping me busy and and, and enjoying life off the rugby. All right, Sean. Well, thank you very much for coming on the show, and we'll let you get back to making that video, mate. <laughs> cool. I'll go for two hours. <laughs> cheers, guys. Yeah, cheers, Sean. And also, can Thanks, you give Scout Brits uh, a message for me? I got him a place at the Cabbage Patch. Friend of the show, Stuart. Eighteen tables uh, or eighteen seats at a table for Scout Brits. Didn't turn up. No show. So um, oh, no. the guy at the Cabbage Patch it, is waiting for him. It sounds exactly like him, right? Yeah. He, he, <laughs> Big time. He, he, he is like the most yeah, unpredictable person. You'll, I, I've known him for a very long time. He's the weirdest guy in the world. Yeah, he did it with a smile wearing his slippers. So he's out there somewhere. <laughs> Cheers, John. Thanks very much. Really appreciate it. Thanks, John. All the best. Cheers. Thanks, mate. Well, we can have a chat now with a man who played a major role in that win for England over the spring box at Twickenham. Scrum half, Ruffy Quirk joins us now. How are you, mate? Yeah, very good. Thank you. Recovered and back in Manchester. So, yeah. <laughs> You're playing it down, Rafi, I'm sure. We were just talking about it. Well, I was anyway. Very jealous in a good way of you young lads playing at the top of your game. Uh, talk us through the feeling of the weekend scoring that try. Because I watched yourself and I watched Freddie's interview at the end and I was like, fair play to these lads. They are living the dream. How did it feel? Um, it was amazing, really. I was just like in the zone, sort of like. So the week before against Australia, when Jamie Bermeyer scored at the end, I was running behind him. And I could hear like I could hear Twickenham, and the whole place was just like ringing. I vibrated. It felt like it. But when I scored, like I didn't feel like that at all. It felt pretty quiet until like, I turned around and like Freddie and um, Joe March and Max Mayans were all there, and the three and I jumped up and like almost fell over and must had a massive pile on. And then after that, like walking back and just hearing the whole place ringing, then was crazy because you're sort of in the zone, so you don't actually hear it at the time. And then you watch like loads of replays back. Um, and then, yes, yeah, it is literally stuff you dream of. So, my dad like, said to me yesterday, like, no one can take that moment away from you. So, no, they certainly can't, mate. They certainly can't. It's amazing. And you, all the emotion came out as well, didn't it? It looked like you were just on top of the world when you scored the try, and your face was an absolute picture. I want to rewind that the feeling coming on because it was the game was in the balance when you came on, wasn't it? it was obviously, England were under pressure up front. Eddie Jones makes some changes, brings you on. The buzz that you must have got going onto the field before you even scored the try would, would have been phenomenal as well, right? Yeah, like obviously you sort of want to come on either battering a team or you're maybe getting battered and then you've not got anything to lose. So, yeah, it being close was was crazy. And the week before, I got told to get up and get ready quite a few times before I actually um, got on. So I was this time when I got told to get up and get ready in my head, I was like, oh yeah, probably maybe only like 15 minutes time or something. And then they were like, you're on the next break of play. So I was like, shit, I better get a few more passes in, um, like, hurry myself up a little bit. And then, yeah, and then went on. And I, I was saying to my last today, it was just, it was like watching TV and then myself putting myself into the TV and actually being there. Because obviously I'm about to put the ball in the scrum, like, that's the first thing I did. And there's, like, Sia Khaleesi there, Etzabeth. People who I literally was watching on YouTube maybe like last week before the game or something or like just seeing their highlights all the time and watching growing up so I was it just felt like a bit like literally like I was just put into a TV and like living a dream yeah absolutely mate and fully deserved as well uh, a lot of people talked about you in the lead up to this championship there's been a lot of stuff going around at sale as well watch out for this lad and I suppose there's an element of pressure that comes with that as well but how was last week let's just go back the week before becoming the youngest scrum half in 90 years to make your debut for England like how are them things are they kind of milestones that you enjoy having Do you, how are your family about these things because it's not just you is it it is your family your club your school people that have had a big kind of yeah. input and involvement in your career 
yeah, it, it is pretty cool. Like, obviously, you don't really, I don't really know about any of that stuff till afterwards. Um, like my mum told me it went for like a Sunday roast with them after after the game last week, and like they just tell me all this stuff, and I had no idea. Um, yeah, it is pretty bonkers. You try and because like when I first came into camp, because I was young and thought I am young, and I thought like all these people much older than me, and I thought sort of you don't want to act like you've won a competition to be there kind of thing. But um, it sort of felt like that a little bit. And then I was like, I need to really park that. So if I, to be like a full member of the squad and be challenging people if I've got a different opinion on something or um, if I think someone should run a different line here or I've got a different box move or th- these kind of things, like I need to actually be a bit more senior and think about like those kind of things. So, um, yeah, all these like records and all that kind of stuff, I don't really know about so like soon after, but it's pretty cool, yeah. No, it's class to hear. And you've obviously had a good apprenticeship under Faf de Klerk. Hopefully that changes and he ends up becoming the apprentice, I'm sure. But like, how much of an influence has he had? I mean, he's obviously a world-class player. You could arguably say he's in the top three in the world. But I suppose now, having played the way that you've played in the last couple of games and the experiences, how invaluable is he been? Yeah, he's been amazing all the way through like last season and stuff and making my debut and all the way through. Whenever he started, I, I knew my role last season, like Faf would start and I'd try and bring some energy off the bench. Um, so I'd watch my games back with him afterwards and he'd pick up things and I'd pick up things and have loads of different questions and stuff for each other. And yeah, he's been massive for me. Sort of just the way like he's such a confident player. Like things things might go wrong. He might not throw the best pass, but he moves on to the next thing and then he'll have a moment of brilliance and just uh, change the game. And that's the kind of player I want to be like, if I make a mistake, not just dwelling on it and it affecting me for the rest of the game, that kind of thing. Uh, yeah, he messaged me after the Australia game, just saying like, "Congrats, mate! Uh, very proud." That kind of thing. And I just asked for some like some tips for the South Africa game, and he just uh, told me to do one really. <laughs> <laughs> I did um, uh, <laughs> on that. I did interview him pre-match on Saturday. I did a corporate society thing with him. I interviewed him, and he I, we ended up chatting about you on stage. And I said, "Look." Tell us about Rafi because, you know, he's your kind of understudy apprentice kind of thing at, at sale. And now he's playing for England. So surely he's going to be first choice when you get fit again. And he was like, mate, I hope he put, comes off the bench and plays really well. But South Africa win by 20 points because, uh, you know, obviously he's South Africa first. But he was immensely proud of hearing and seeing you on the bench. So uh, you must have a really good relationship. And what about his hair? How lovely is his hair to touch as well? Yeah, it's beautiful. Isn't it? <laughs> um, yeah, I saw him today again with Big Hug. Um, and I saw him go and speak to Lou and they must have had a little quick catch up about what's going on but that's a 1-0 to us yeah and how did you celebrate the game afterwards obviously it's a massive win it's the end of a three match series for you boys you've been you know living in a bubble pretty much it's been pretty tough we've seen some of the training on social media but did you get to have a few beers all together did you get out and about uh, yeah we did get to have a few beers together so like against Australia I got a bit of a hamstring soft tissue little injury so I didn't so I was banned from the beers on that night, which was a bit tough after the first cap. Um, but then, yeah, we had we all went back to the hotel after the game. Um, we weren't allowed out because of all the COVID situation, but people's partners and some families and stuff were at the hotel and had a nice little cocktail bar. All the boys are drinking mojitos and, and stuff all night. So it was like, I know it's not the most macho, that is it? But... <laughs> nice, mate. It's a, it's yeah. a... I'm a GNT man myself, I'm a Guinness, so anything goes for me. Yeah, so free bar's not bad, and all the boys stayed up pretty late and had some good sing songs and stuff. It was great. All right, Rafi, thank you so much for coming on the show, mate. And uh, no doubt we'll see you at a live show at some time in the near future. And bits of luck for the rest of the season. Cheers. Thanks for having me, lads. Cheers, Rafi. Cheers, Rafi. Rafi. Thanks, mate. Class act, mate. Thanks very much. Well, you mentioned Scotland have reached their ceiling, Jim. How high was their ceiling against Japan? Why well, have been horrible, Jim. I'm being honest, Andrew. Horrible. You're basically saying that's as good as it's going to get for Scotland. Why are we so horrible, James? And you live in Scotland now. You've got to be careful. We beat Japan. We beat Japan, who arguably could have won the World Cup, and we beat Australia a third of the world. So, And we lost to the world champions. Um, it, Scotland is an interesting one because we've done very well over the last 12 months. And I say that, again, we can keep harping on about it. Beat England, beat France away in Paris, England away at Twickenham. If it wasn't for a red card, we would have beat Wales. If it wasn't for this and that, we would have beat Ireland. We beat Italy. 
And then we go into this autumn nation series and we hammer Tonga, no disrespect, in the first game. We beat Australia in a very different way. We didn't beat South Africa, but they're the world champions. And you can kind of understand the way that they play that we always struggle with. And the way that South Africa play is how we struggled against Japan at the weekend. I mean, it was a close game in the end, 29-20. And to be fair, if it wasn't for the inaccuracies around Japan, then the game could have been a little bit different. And I say that they've reached the ceiling. It's a bloody good ceiling. Like it really is. But you look at Is it a really high place. is it a low ceiling or a high ceiling? I'm trying to work this out. Yeah, is it one of those new builds or is it like an back, old you, you no, basically it's an said old that, Georgian? No, it's an old Georgian Edinburgh house. You basically said there's no more growth in this squad. It's, I, mate, I'm amazed that you had the cojones to say this. Well, I look at that and I say that, I can quite honestly say it. You look at now the profile of the team, we've got the best people in and around Scotland playing for Scotland. The younger group of players coming through aren't that good. You just mentioned France before. They won the last, whatever, Six Nations World Cups or whatever that they've done. Italy are actually all right coming through. We know England are always going to be strong. Ireland are always going to be strong. Why have been horrible about Wales? So I look at Scotland now, and John Barkley mentioned it. He said it's a once-in-a-generation team. And I kind of do feel... Hey, don't be, dragging, to, don't, be, don't be dragging anyone else into this, James. This is you, Sam. Yeah, I know. I, I, but, but it's good... So <laughs> it's like, as good like, as it gets. Look, it's a high ceiling. It is as good as it gets. Like, it is. This, Scotland are good enough to win the Six Nations. I don't know now. Having seen what? Ireland what? do what they've done. What? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, you, just said you just said they've reached the ceiling, James. No, in terms of performances, I don't think. But I think their performances... Maybe we beat... Hang on, Andrew. We put 50 look points at the on you last year. Look, look at the panic. The, on you last year. The, the backtracking now. This is all going out live. It's a million We are years. struggling. We are struggling with... Struggling. Strength. Struggling, winning struggling. the Six Nations. What, what's happening, Jim? We can we can win the Six Nations. We've got England at home. We smashed you last year. We smashed you two years before and three years before. We beat we beat France. Ireland we struggled with. We'll take that. But um, we weren't very good against Japan. In fact, I thought we were. We were average at best. Back to being horrible. You're English again now, aren't you, Jim? Come on, just say it. No, I'm not. Scotland says, oh, look, I want Scotland to do well. And, you know, we beat Australia and we struggle. And my point is going to be this. We struggle with the physicality of the game. We just haven't got, you know, big swindon born Ebenezer Beth Eaters, do you know what I mean? More <laughs> munching ruckers. We struggle yeah. in that area. And against Japan, we struggle. Like, we're on the back foot. Every time they carried the ball, they made yards. You know, we were inaccurate around the breakdown. Uh, we were better at scrum and we were better at line out. And we saw that against Tonga where there was inaccuracies in the game around that. And we saw that against South Africa. We got munched up front. So if you're looking at it and you're playing against an England who want to respect Scotland or you play against an Ireland team like they did against the All Blacks or even Wales with the way that they can play and have been a difficult team for us in recent years because of the way that they play, then we've reached the ceiling. I don't know where the evolution is in terms of like being able to add that level of physicality that these other teams have got. On any given day, we can beat anyone, apart from the All Blacks for a bit. But, and I say that, yeah, I say this in the best of life. That's how I feel about Scotland rugby at the minute. It's been a good autumn for us. The Japan game could have been a banana skin. It wasn't. And uh, we beat Australia and we smashed Tonga. So what, what more can we look into apart from the fact that I've just convinced everyone that we're winning the Six Nations are probably the World Cup. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's look at Wales's performance then, because they had a, you know, beating Australia, but both teams were, you know, a lot of injuries, didn't they? All I'm getting from that game is that David Rennie ain't at her. No, that he's is not happy, is he? Yeah. And there's a few talking points around it, but I'm really pleased for Wales because, although I'm a quarter Welsh, um, which helps... They had the toughest of autumns, didn't they? They've played, played four tests. They've got a horrific injury list. Of the four tests, they've taken on the big three Southern Hemisphere teams. They couldn't have had an, a harder autumn in terms of the fixtures. You know, they got properly tested against Fiji as well in round three. They, first up against New Zealand out the window, they can see 50. Then South Africa, they're right in that battle. And then the bomb squad monster them up front. Um, they, they get a victory over Fiji by hook or by crook and were properly tested. And then, you know, they can now see it as a success. You know, he's he's blooded a lot of other players as well, Wayne Pivak has. Um, you know, and there are a few things that went in their favour. You, you can't, you know, you, you can't argue against it. Nick Tompkins' try. Um, hey, what do you think? Uh, it's a try. 
yeah, for, for me. But it's just weird the way all the Aussies just stop and like, oh, it's a knock on. The oldest thing, you know, the, the first thing you coach players when you're at school is play to the whistle. Everybody play to the whistle. The Aussies just stopped. And even Nick Tompkins like picked up the ball and nonchalantly went on. Um, yeah, they could have had a red card, Gareth Thomas, you know, with a uh, sort of forearm to the face on a clear out. Um, yeah, I thought that was a red card, not a yellow. Hey, one of the most amazing stats, James, Lewis Reece Summit, 48 minutes, he comes off the field. He hadn't touched the ball. He's the, their most potent attacking threat, and he hadn't touched the ball after 48 minutes. Ridiculous. Comes injured. Yeah, crazy, yeah. crazy. But, yeah, Wales, I'm delighted they got the win. And Australia looked good. Like, they've gone down to 14 men, obviously. Um, you know, Valentini with the, the bang on Adam Beard. I mean, how's your face? You seen the picture of Adam Beard's face? I, well, I saw him coming off. Is it the bad? Not was it? He didn't come back on, and I saw the claret. And it was, mate. It was proper. Was it? it was an upright tackle where Valentini. Well, yeah, so I saw. Yeah, I saw the tackle. I just didn't see. I, I didn't know how bad his face was after. But yeah, it was. Uh, it was a nasty head collision. Yeah, and uh, yeah, I think the Australians have complained a bit. Dave Rennie's, as you said, Jim, not happy with the ref, and there were some contentious things there. Yeah, listen, it was a decent game actually. I thought uh, Australia. They're a proper outfit again. You know, they're missing players. I like their back row. They didn't have Hooper, but you know, they're still got some big old units in that team. And if Australia could start the discipline, you go back to the England game the week before, they gave a silly amount of penalties away. And again, it hampered them against Wales with the red card, but they still showed some absolute touches of class throughout the game. And you know, Wales hung in there to the end. Gareth Davis makes the break up the touchline. Yeah, which eventually leads to the penalty um, for, for offside. I think it was in the end. And Priestland, at 34 years of age, big nuts. It's not an easy kick, that. Everyone's expecting to get it in the whole stadium. And he looks so cool, calm and collected with it all. Lovely strike. I mean, my arsehole would be going 10 to the dozen if that was me. It looked um, but, easy, that kick. Was it not easy? Uh, uh, mate, when you know the game is on it and you've got, it's on the 15 metre line, everyone in the world expects you to get it. Whereas in front of the post, you could probably close your eyes and knock it over. But on the 15 metre line, you've only got a snap or kit or, you know, that little element of doubt creeps into your mind. Well, there would have been uh, doubt in his mind, Goody, because if you remember, he got booed off the field. Do you remember? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah. yeah, you're right. Actually, I can't imagine how he was feeling. But the Island Fords did it again over the weekend, didn't they? Smash the Argentina pack. You've got to feel for the Argentinians in, in a way because... You know, you heard Mario Ledesma say afterwards around they've been they haven't played at home since before the World Cup of 2019. Just put that into perspective. Every game you played since prior to the World Cup of 2019 has been away from home. So they've been on the road for two years. They've been in these bubbles. You know, he's worried about the mental health of some of the players. Not played a home fixture in Argentina where Jim, we've both played there. The atmosphere in Argentina when you play against Argentina in their own country is phenomenal. So um you know, they're at the end of their tether in terms of travel, bubbles, um, you know, fatigue, everything like that. It's been bloody difficult for them, let's be honest. And how good were Ireland, though? They've had a hell of a good autumn series, haven't they? Yeah, they have. And ultimately, when you beat the All Blacks the week before, people are thinking that's the pinnacle. But the biggest challenge is then to back it up and have a big performance. And there were parts of their game that were a bit rusty. Uh, I know they made a few changes, but, you know, the form they're in, Caleb Miel Doris, again. We need to get him on. We need to get Caleb Miel Doris on in the next what couple of weeks. He's, he's, I, I told you. Do you remember me saying to you yeah, years yeah, yeah. ago? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they fronted up again and, and backed it up. Ireland, all of a sudden, you've gone from, I don't know, it's this weird thing. They've completely changed the way they attack, and it's a very Leinster esque way. But there's always been a question around Ireland's physicality Not in that. terms of when they're playing England and when they've played other teams, you know, they've got this pace, fast paced game they can play. They're so physical now. Have they just basically put on about 10 kilos each and start burying boys because something's happened and it's phenomenal because they're on the front foot, they're winning collisions. I watched Kayla Mill Doris take the ball into contact. He's getting absolutely smoked by two RGs and then he's bounced off the tackle and gone through and scored. <laughs> Roll out. <laughs> yeah. So it's, you know, they've now got the physical. You go back to the Lentz team that got munched by Larochelle in the knockout. And that was kind of symptomatic of how Irish rugby was. You know, when it came to the big physical challenges, you know, Ireland against England, we had the wood over them. But then that Ireland performance last year in the Six Nations where they dominated England has led on 
to these performances in the autumn and you know Mike Cat give him his dues as, as coach I think he's taken a bit of stick in Ireland about how they were attacking their attack looks so sharp now and that's probably around the whole Leinster Lancaster thing and you know against the All Blacks they started 12 Leinster players so if you're an Irish fan you're so excited about this squad because there's a lot of good young players in it that have got seven eight years at international rugby thanks Gary and you've got a shout out to finish off with thank you Jim Yes, I do. I've got a big shout out to Rugby March and St. Peter's Hospice in Bristol. They've teamed up with the Bristol Bears and on Sunday the 13th of March, they'll be doing a sponsored six mile walk through Bristol's scenic surroundings and reaching the finish line at Ashton Gate Stadium in time for the live Bristol Bears versus Quinns match. So spaces are limited, but you can sign up now if you want to join in. The entry is £30, which includes your ticket. For the match and all the money you raise in addition will go to supporting patient care across Bristol. So just head to rugbymarch.co.uk if you want to get in the mixer. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Goody. Thanks, producer Tristan. And thank you very much for listening. Don't forget to check us out on YouTube and make sure you've subscribed on Spotify as well. Rugby spot. Spotify pod, 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 pod. <laughs>